Oh, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Got this thing adjusted right, I hope? Good. Um, that was a good question about the bacteria well. The only thing that it brought to mind, and I want to tie it in with Adam, uh, with the winter kill situation, um, well, some of the worst bacteria wilt that I've seen in my tenure with the green section was following a winter kill event. And everybody pushed really hard to get their POA back, as you would do. You want to get the greens open as fast as you can. So, you know, you're fertilizing like a new green situation. Push, push, push. Uh, just try to get grass cover. And I remember um, really stressed greens uh, where clubs did that. And the POA, it wasn't the bent grass. This was taking out the weakest of the weak POAs, all those annual biotypes that came in. They might have seeded. And then we got really hot weather in June, and I think Adam alluded to the fact, don't push things too hard. There's nothing worse than getting grass back, and you're all pumped up, you're psyched. You got the greens you know, back into play faster than you expected to watch them decline in third week in June. Because you know, once they decline again in June, they're not coming back. It's going to be a long summer. And uh, the bacteria wilt, though, is the weakest of the weak strains, I think. And, you know, it just takes out the weaker grasses and such. So, uh, so be careful with the winter kill. I hope everybody is in, in pretty good shape. We're a little bit better off, I think, further north in New England this year. We had our, our bouts with it last year. And before I get started also, I just want to recognize Jim Snow. Uh, Jim, we're fortunate to have Jim come out with us today and, and join us. And uh, National Director of the Green Section, as you all know, many of you know Jim when he used to travel out here. Uh, he trained me out on the island, on Long Island, and uh, used to visit golf courses out here for a long time before Dave Otis and myself. So uh, some of you still remember Jim uh, visiting your golf courses, I'm sure. And I, I just want to acknowledge the fact that uh, Jim received quite an award last month. Um, he, we were in Orlando, and Audubon International uh, or, uh, honored Jim with the Environmental uh, Leadership Award. And it was presented to him. It's the first time the award was, uh, was put out there. It's their 20th anniversary of Audubon uh, International and the Audubon Cooperative Sanctuary Program for golf courses. Uh, how many are members of Audubon Coop or involved with Audubon Cooperative Sanctuary? 2,400 golf courses now, I believe, internationally. So um, no better guy to get it because I remember uh, 20 years ago when this pro program was, was talked about with Ron Dotson, there are a lot of naysayers, and even on our staff, and you know some questions about it. And Jim was really worked hard and supported it right through, and was uh, one of their biggest advocates. So, without Jim, I don't know where Audubon would be today on golf courses. So, I just wanted to acknowledge Jim on that award, and uh, I think that was uh, that was quite a deal. So, um, I'll get in with my presentation. Uh, I was excited to get this topic. It was, uh, it was not something, it wasn't something I came up with. Um, I have to give credit to Chris Carson and uh, other, others who attended the meeting to set up uh, the seminar. And uh, when Dave Otis mentioned that, hey, this is a good topic, would you like to do it? I said, oh, my Lord, this thing will take care of itself. And it basically did. I went out and offered uh, or asked many superintendents, some general managers, and club officials to give me their inputs. And you know, what do you think is important that you would want your superintendent to know? And what do you think is important for green committees, club officials, members to know? And uh, some of the responses were quite interesting. Uh, probably some are very predictable, uh, but you'll see some patterns that develop. And this is still a work in progress, believe me. Um, I try to get out and get in, you know, input from uh, different levels of clubs. And uh, I wanted to get a good cross section of people. And uh, hopefully, you know, you'll see some trends. Like I said, it's a work in, in progress, and there's probably going to be more input, and as there is, we'll, we'll go. Uh, you know, it'll develop, maybe become an article at one point or another. So hopefully sit back and enjoy it. A lot of this you'll probably already know, and, and, uh, and the club officials that are in the audience or those that are already uh, educated or interested in being educated, it's the ones that aren't here that we probably would like to get to a little bit more. Um, but it should stimulate some conversation, if nothing else. So let's start with the club officials. And what are the, the things I wish my golf course superintendent knew? Well, the art of communication. I think any of our presentations, I think as superintendents, as USGA agronomists, we know communication, communication, communication. There's no, I, I would say at this point, in the evolution of the industry, the options for communication have never been better. 
uh, with so much direct electronic communication, ability to get the word out faster, um, you know, we can do a pretty good job of that. But we're going to look at that a little bit more because everybody talks about communication. Biggest concern with some of the green chairman, club officials, and general managers that I talked about with, it's not that you guys aren't good communication people. I mean, you know how to do it, but probably the exposure time is limited. And you're not good enough at tooting your own horns, of, of not actually getting the word out of how complex your job is, how, how difficult it is. And that's frustrating to superintendents because they say, my God, if they only knew what we did, and, and you're out there pounding your heads trying to get that word out. And, I, and so it, it's kind of on both sides, you know. So it's real important to have that trust with your green committee, with your green chairman, to be able to discuss these issues, to work with the chairman to get the face time, to find out what points really need to be talked about more, maybe where you're lacking, and, uh, and try to get a good trustful relationship with your green committee and with the golfers, obviously. Now there are, like I said, there's no better time probably to do it. Um, younger guys, especially who have grown up with the computers and such, are very, very comfortable with electronic communication, but all of us are. We've had to become that way. We kind of evolved into it. Websites are the best way, one of the best ways to do it. And I've sent a lot of people to Baker Hill uh, Golf Club up in New Hampshire just because I thought they did a great job of, of getting the word out, opening up, using this tool to become better communicators with the golfers and so forth. And I just wanted to provide some ideas. Um, I'll tell you, uh, Rob Turcott did a great job putting this together. And in here, he's just got a nice introduction of himself and his staff. And uh, I, I just think it's a great way to go. Let people know who you are. More importantly, maybe let people know who your staff are. Make sure your staff, and this was brought up by a pretty prominent uh, green or, um, uh, general manager up in New England. He said, my goodness, make sure your staff, especially your assistants and your main support staff, look professional. It's hard when Adam was saying, you know, you're out, you're going 24-7, full bore. You got more concerns than maybe how you look. But to members, they're looking at you in a little bit different eye. And it's real important for the assistants, maybe for your irrigation techs, really any of your staff members to get dressed up somewhat clean, clean shaven, and look professional. This website's a great way to introduce people. It puts, you know, a name to a face and gives people a little background in the field so when they come up against these guys on putting greens or whatever they happen to be doing, uh, they're going to have a little bit more feeling for it towards them and, and maybe, you know, be a little bit more understanding with them, have a little bit more etiquette. It's also a good way to get your programs out, obviously. A little background of why we do things. Communication tool. If you're tweeting or blogging, more and more superintendents are in the audience uh, here and, and, and throughout the country we're doing more and more of that. But how specific you have to be, that's up to you. It might get a little bit crazy, uh, but let people know why the greens are being aerified or why you have to run a quick, you know, uh, maybe a, a rescue uh, fungicide application or why you have to cut the trees down. You know, what were you doing behind the sixth green this morning? Well, again, I don't know how specific you have to get, but there are going to be those members that are going to want to know. And this can put out a lot of fires before they really get started. It's a good way to go, and it's not that complicated and more and more superintendents are, are taking a, a shot at it. There is a danger with electronic communication, though, as was brought up. I mean, sometimes things get misinterpreted in emails, and even in some of these uh, probably other forms of electronic communication. You still have to have face-to-face -face communication. So when's a good time to do it? When isn't a good time to do it? It's probably always pretty good to, you know, to be out there, to be noticed, to be recognized. But certainly with any of the outings that you have or bigger events that you have at the club, you want to be forefront. Interact with the members as much as possible. And there are different ways to do it. Playing golf is probably one of the best ways to do it. Uh, but other means just being out in the field. Um, so it's important where to be front and center with the members. And I think that's where your green committee can be really helpful uh, in that regard as well. Uh, it was also brought up uh, by one of the club ex or former club officials is, you know, it's important to be out up front, but uh, it's a tough job. And superintendents have to have thick skin. And I know it's awful hard to get beaten up day after day after day, um, but, and I give you guys a lot of credit because I don't think I could have the patience for it, um, but, you know, how to deal with golfers' criticisms. Hopefully some of those criticisms 
have been filtered, uh, but you're going to get you're just going to get it in the field. So be able to take that, be rational about it. Don't take it personal, although it's awfully hard to do because some of the attacks are personal. Um, and and that's, that's a huge challenge. And that's going to be real important as far as learning how to, to communicate and get it done. Again, interaction with the members. Whether you're playing golf, I thought this was great. I don't know how many clubs do this anymore, but um, up in New England, some of the lower budget clubs still have membership work days or worker B days in the fall or maybe in the spring right now be you know help with course cleanup or specific projects that they can't do. I guess that's not that popular anymore, huh? <laughs> Damn. Well this club actually the boys had a good time. They edged they edged bunkers for them and they had a half a keg of beer when it was all said and done at a big dinner and they went at it and I'll tell you, everybody was real happy with each other by the end of the day. They got to know the staff. They got to know, uh, you know, each other. And I just thought it was a great way to build some goodwill. No surprises, all right? We know that, too. But be upfront. Be honest. With this winter kill situation, that's what we always really push, you know? I mean, there's some cases where you, you know, you can't hide this, obviously. This is an irrigation break that washed, washed off 50 foot of... Uh, pristine bank uh, up in Massachusetts. So uh, the environmental police were here in about 10 minutes uh, when they come and check this out, and they lost part of their teeth. But anyway, uh, when it comes to agronomic problems on the golf course, whether it was the summer stress problems or winter kill, be upfront, be honest with the committee, with your membership. This is what happened. This is why we think it happened. Whether it was your fault or whether it was poor, you know, the expectations were too high, as Adam was saying. And then what, how long is it going to take to get it back? And what do we have to do to get it back? And what do we have to do to prevent it from reoccurring in the future? And that's all you can do. And hopefully, um, you know, get the course and get the operation on the right uh, path. Well, with that, I'm going to switch gears because I did get a heck of a lot more input from superintendents than I did from club officials. Um, a lot of the club official information was pretty much on that routine of communication and, and things like that and some specifics of we're good, and I, I, but I'm not going to get into. Um, the things I wish my golf course uh, superintendent knew, I'll finish up with that, but the importance of taking an active role in developing um, long-range maintenance plan. And I think this kind of ties into communication. Um, and that's part of it. But come up with a plan, stick to that plan, um, and then through that deal, that will help you deal with unrealistic expectations and help procure the resources to meet those expectations, to get the budget, to get the, the, the staff, the, the labor that you require to, to get the conditions that the members want. And to me, that is communication, too. I mean, it's tying one into the other. And this is a, a way, a means to help you, uh, you know, come up with the, the resources that you need to get it done to deal with demands, the more ever-increasing demands. How are you going to reach those playing conditions that are, that are so desired? Having said that, this is part committee as well as superintendent. Um, yes, they want the superintendent to take an active role in developing like a mission statement or maintenance standards. Obviously, it's going to be a very prominent role. But if you don't have the support of the committee to do that, if you don't have the backing of the board, the value of the mission statement, the value of, of that maintenance standards is, is diminished. So it's, it goes both ways, for sure. Um, I thought it was another good point, too, of a green chairman, ex-green chairman. He said, when you are in trouble, I wish our guy was secure enough to go out and get the help he needs, wherever it might be, his peers. It might be the green section. Um, you know, whatever. Get the information. Let us know. Don't try to hold it together yourself. There's a lot of information out there. Get out there, be proactive, and get that information, and let's get the problem solved, and let's make sure that uh, if it's a problem of expectations or uh, budget or equipment needs, let's get the support, let's get these things taken care of, and let's make the membership know and aware of it and hopefully uh, convince them of the need. Uh, again, just to finish up here, the importance of developing trust with the Green Committee and the membership, that was another one. Um, I thought this was pretty interesting uh, because I also got this from the superintendents. And it's a real important feeling that you got to have some kind of a, a tie, a relationship with a green chairman uh, where you can just vent when you have to vent and vice versa. And again, not take it personal. Know that that conversation is not going to leave that room. There's some pretty heated discussions during the, heat of, during the battle of summer and everybody's under a lot of stress. 
you got to have a relationship uh, with the superintendent. You're on the same page. You might not agree on all the issues. You shouldn't. You're not going to. Uh, but it's going to remain professional. And you're going to be able to throw ideas back and forth without you know, hurting each other's feelings or taking it overly personal and then uh, having some of those heated discussions leave the room. So having that trust, allowing the superintendent to trust the Green Committee and so forth. And, and unfortunately, I don't see that in a lot of uh, golf courses that I'm affiliated with. There's a lot of antagonism between the two for whatever reason. And it's a tough working relationship. And it's more survival for the superintendent, or that's the feeling I think that they have. We got to survive this green chairman uh, for the next two or three years. And that's a shame. And, and sometimes that's the way it's going to be because you just, there's the lack of trust is there. And uh, it's hard to develop that. It's not going to be instantaneous. It's something that has to be developed. So, and then finally, stick to their expertise. Now, usually I hear that the other way around. Uh, you know, we wish the green chairman stuck to his expertise or the members stuck to their expertise. In this case, it was the superintendent. You know, you're a good agronomist. You manage people. You manage our budget. An architect, maybe not so much. Uh, we'll value your opinions and advice, but uh, there comes a point when we have an architect um, and we have a golf professional. So uh, Matt was interesting. I thought it was a pretty interesting uh, comment. So, And then the art of being patient equally important. Uh, it's hard to get be patient. It's hard for members to be patient. We, again, we always say the members aren't patient. They want it tomorrow. Well, superintendents get a little frustrated, too, when you don't get maybe the capital budget that you're expecting. Or you want a project, you've got to get an irrigation system in. You're pounding your head against the wall. It takes time. And I think green committees, in some cases, with the economic turndowns that we had, you know, we know we need it. Uh, we're on the same page, but we're not going to get it overnight. Unfortunately, the roof and the clubhouse needed to get fixed. Uh, maybe it's not the right priority, but that's the way it is. So, you know, that's, the, that's where you're going with it. All right, let's turn it and go to the Green Committee. The importance of communication, trust between the Green Chairman Committee members, board membership. Just what I mentioned before, uh, but a little bit different uh, side of things. But um, it got real important for the superintendent to be able to trust your green chairman. And if you don't have that trust, it's just going to be a miserable relationship. It's a survival mode for the superintendent, not feeling that you have the support of the chairman or the committee, or you just, you just can't trust the support being there when you really need it. Um, and and it's, it's difficult. What does a good green chairman, green committee, uh, hopefully do as far as communication? Ambassador of goodwill for the maintenance department. You know, these are the programs. These are the mission statements. We're supporting it. This is the long-range goal of the program, of the club. My goal is to get those resources, support the staff. Let's get those things going. Uh, hopefully get more exposure for the superintendent. As I mentioned earlier, filter some of the criticisms. Know which criticisms are valid. Be tactful in how you dismiss some of those criticisms or deal with them. Hopefully save wear and tear on your superintendent because he doesn't really need to know about the restroom or the, uh, you know, uh, the trash container at such and such, or that uh, brown area in the right rough 10 yards off of the fairway. Uh, you know, those are things that aren't really all that important in the scheme of things, especially when you're dealing with a real difficult summer like we had. Support the staff and its mission. That's the bottom line. Some basic knowledge is what we would like to see of, of, from, uh, from green committees and green chairmen. And, and this was... I mean, this, everybody mentioned this. Uh, Agronomy 101 and just the general background of the operations and objectives. And then, in addition to that, the role of the Green Committee and the Chairman. Uh, you don't, I mean, this is a complex business. And I don't think superintendents are expecting their club officials or their Green Chairman to have advanced agronomy degrees, and there's no need for that. And just likewise, a club official hopefully wouldn't expect a superintendent to know what he does in his own professional business. Um, but if you're going to take the role of a green chairman, you're going to be on the green committee, there's a responsibility there. And we'd like to see the education. Just get some background. Now, why do we airify? Uh, you know, what's the idea? What's the problem with shade? You know, why are trees being taken down? Um, you know, what does it take to grow good grass? What does it take to provide 
the conditions that our members want. Are the conditions that the members are calling for realistic? Well, you can't make that determination if you don't have a little bit of a background. So where do you get this background? Again, this is a, probably a better opportunity than ever to get education. We set it with communication, and it's the same thing. Adam touched on the, on the web page a little bit. And if you're a new club official, uh, it's there. Uh, you can go on the USGA website, Turf Care, and um, committee information topics, you can go there and, and click on that. And look at all the topics you can get. You can get a fairly substantial education uh, by working through the process. This will take you to a bunch of articles. Uh, you can see uh, air, airification, aeration, and cultivation, uh, different links that you can get to. If you're interested to see what the Green Committee function is, um, there's plenty of topics with the Green Committee um, there. So learn what you're supposed to do, what the function is, the, how to support uh, your, the staff and the operations and so forth. Excellent source of information. Adam mentioned the regional updates. It's a good way to stay current. Find out what's happening in the region if you're in the Green Committee or you're a chairman. There's going to be a lot of rumors. There's going to be a lot of, uh, you're going to pick things up playing other golf courses. And, and some of those ideas that you get probably aren't going to be realistic. Um, hopefully, we, we keep this updated every two weeks and we're trying to get the information out and what's important, what's hot topic at that time. So use those. That's a good starting point to, to be able to find out what other clubs are, are dealing with and, and is it the same at your golf course and for your superintendent. And this is just one that Adam did actually in March with the winter kill uh, more, more recently and uh, last week actually. So it's there. The news is there. The information is there. You just have to go out and find it. Finally, for Green Chairman, I just wanted to mention, and it's not available yet if you're on a USGA committee, um, you can have access to it. It's, I believe it's going to be fairly soon. We're working in that direction. But it's the uh, USGA University. And right now, they, have, um, they actually have a, uh, a lesson, um, one of these mini sessions for Green Committee Chairman, for new chairman. Hopefully, when they figure out how they're going to offer this, it's going to be a great little way, um, interactive uh, webinar type session uh, for a new green chairman. And it kind of di discusses the responsibilities and, and uh, hopefully how the, the, the steps you have to take to become a good green chairman. So it's that knowledge. Gain that knowledge. Do a better job uh, of being a, a chairman and help the club out. All right, some of the other things that uh, were brought up were, you know, the impacts of weather. Last year, maybe it was so fresh in the mind that that's why it was a, a, a big concern. But the impacts of weather uh, obviously impact everything we do on the golf course. It impacts our ability to provide conditions. Uh, clubs always, uh, you know, members and so forth, how come the greens roll so well in the fall? How come, you know, why are they different at 1 o'clock in the afternoon as compared to 8 o'clock in the morning? There's a lot of impacts of weather, especially rain. Uh, you'll see it with the winter kill. Uh, yes, we try to do things. Uh, one of our long-range goals uh, as agronomists and as superintendents is to develop conditions that are going to be less dependent on Mother Nature, on rain, so we can tolerate wet conditions and still provide firm and fast conditions and, and maintain the, you know, meet the high expectations that are, that, are, that are called for. But we're still at Mother Nature's mercy. We can't or at the mercy of Mother Nature. And that still dictates really how much we can do, especially on old POA greens and, and, and push up greens that we have on older golf courses. So uh, there are limitations. And we're never going to be completely consistent. And we shouldn't be. It's a natural system. And you know it changes with the weather. And it, just a little bit of understanding, I think, would be great. And uh, get a background of, of what's going on out in the field. And, and I think the weather side of it, you'll gain more respect for the weather and its impacts. And what you're forced to do. This was, again, winter injury. Uh, you know, that's going to dictate your whole, much of the first half of the summer season, especially if you're severely injured and you have to get these greens back. They're not going to be your greens until sometime in July, if you're lucky. They'll be back, but you know, it's still going to impact your superintendent's ability to provide conditions that you're accustomed to. Just because it's you know it's a new grass, new greens, trying to get them back. So, real important thing with the weather. The other one is the course comparisons just aren't fair. 
Uh, they're certainly typically not accurate, and they're not helpful. Um, and we still see an awful lot of unfair course comparisons. Part of it's with television, and, and, and part of it is just course to course. Similar with budget impact on course conditioning and just unrealistic expectations. They all tie together um, in, in many cases. Part of it's going to be with TV golf. You know, you've heard that before, but Augusta's going to be on television in a couple of weeks, short weeks. Everybody looks forward to seeing Augusta, the first major. But with that, there's always a little bit of Augusta syndrome, and people wish they had the same kind of conditioning uh, further north, and they try to emulate Augusta, for better or for worse. And the same with the U.S. Open. We hear a lot about green speed in the weeks or week or 10 days following the U.S. Open. Um, it's a problem. And... And one of the superintendents responded, you know, said, hey, we, what, what our green committees and members see for a seven-day tournament, they want for 30 weeks of the year. We can't do that. It's a temporary setup. A lot of resources are taken to provide those incredible conditions that you see on these championships and on television, uh, weekend tournaments. Um, and it, it's not something that's realistic for most golf courses to do in the field on a daily basis, uh, for any golf course to do on a daily basis. So realize that. Uh, some of the other parts with the budget, the, the unfair expectations, the unfair comparisons, um, is labor, you know, breaking down a budget. The biggest difference between courses and the ability to provide uh, conditions or meet expectations is the, often the labor side of it. How many man hours does your golf course operate with? Um, I've been asking that now for about 10 years, and it's, it's pretty interesting uh, just to see the differences. If a club has 1,100 man hours per week on the golf course and another one has 700 man hours per week, the club with 700 man hours per week is going to have a hard time providing conditions that are comparable to the other golf course, yet the comparisons are there all the time. So breaking that down, quantifying your labor, and then taking it to the next step. That's not good enough, you know. How is your labor for your site? How does it compare to what other courses are doing? How big are your acreages? How many acres of greens are you maintaining? How many acres of bunkers are you maintaining? Um, that might help justify why another club has more hours than you do or why you have more hours than they do. Uh, but it's important if you're going to make comparisons, if you're going to demand a certain level of playability, then you have to provide the resources to make those conditions possible. And, Labor is going to be the probably have the biggest impact on it. Another one issue that really came up, and it was something that I overlooked and I never should have, and I see it on a lot of my visits, um, but I'm glad it, it was brought up by many of the superintendents. Um, it was the need for respect for what we do and who we are. And they weren't crying. They weren't whining. I think it was realistic, and I think they were just, you know, a little bit frustrated, especially after a pretty difficult year and, and so forth of, uh, of what people, you know, what the staffs went through. And we'll look at that in a little bit. Micromanagement is counterproductive. We've all dealt with that. A new chairman comes in and maybe just retired. Uh, a lot of time on their hands. Well, what do they do? The wife's happy to get them out of the house, go to the golf course. Show up at the maintenance facility every morning at 6 o'clock with the staff. Nice short list. I think we should do A, B, and C today. I don't like that wet spot you have over on the left side of the fairway. When are you going to trim the forsythia bushes to flower it out? Completely can screw up a, a, a day of maintenance. Get you, you know, it gets the rhythm of the operation broken up. The priorities are disregarded and the maintenance staff can be chasing their tail and not really get anything done and they just lose their efficiency. So it's not a place to micromanage. Respect the professional. They're there 24-7. They know what they're doing, as I mentioned earlier. You wouldn't expect them to come into your office and tell you how to run your business. Um, it's a very complex business and it's getting more so all the time. Uh, with some of the chemical applications that Adam talked about, use of growth regulators, I mean, we, you know, it's coming from all angles. So, you know, it's important to be there. It's important to have a basic knowledge of what's going on. Um, offer some suggestions and support, but boy, if uh, your superintendent, you're spending, you know, paying them a good chunk of money to be the professional, to 
come up with the programs that are needed to provide the conditions that you expect and, and hopefully let them do their job. Um, it's the way to go. God, look at that young guy bending over there, huh? Holy smokes, he's got, wow. Uh, follow your mission statement. You know, that's an important thing. The superintendent should be a part of that. Um, and the Green Committee should be well aware of what the mission statement is. Hopefully you all have maintenance standards by now. A real good idea if you haven't got them to put them together, get it in writing. And that's what the club, you know, that's what the Green Committee, sh really their prior priority should be, how do we get this accomplished? How do we stay on mission? What's it going to take to get it done? And the guys are working all kinds of hours out there. Um, one thing that I've noticed, knowing quite a few superintendents personally now, you know, you're there at sometimes 4.30 in the morning in the summer, 4, 4.30 in the morning, and you're not going to get out of there till evening, 6.30, 7 o'clock in some cases. You could be there seven days a week. I know it's hard to get meetings together. But do you really have to have that Saturday afternoon meeting at 2.30? Think about the personal life these guys have, you know. Yeah, there might be a criticism, but how important is this complaint or something that you picked up in the grill? Do you really need to call the guy up at 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night when he's probably getting ready for bed or spending the half hour with the kids that he gets during the day? That's about it. Now, there's a life outside the golf course, too, and that should be respected, and that's real important. And, and I, I do see that breakdown, and it's the, the real quality green chairman and committees don't do that. They do respect that. It just seems like there's newer influx, maybe a, a new chairman that's first year on is real excited and probably a little uh, oversensitive uh, to some of the members and complaints and so forth. And, uh, um, and it's a learning curve, but boy, oh boy, think about what they're doing, and they are the professionals. Let them do the job. Respect the staff. They're the same way. They're working hard for you, and uh, hopefully get to know them a little bit, interact with them a little bit, and uh, I, I think everybody will be happy. They'll, they'll definitely appreciate it, and they're going to work harder for you, and they're going to be more open, more friendly to it. Nobody feels worse losing grass in that golf course than your superintendent and his assistants, and probably the mechanic. It's not good. You've got winter kill, or we had the summer stress problems last year. Nobody feels worse. And keep that in mind. Um, it's a tough business, so I, I just wanted to put that in there. All right, here's a few more things, and I'm just about finishing up here, but uh, I thought this was kind of a neat, uh, a neat thing here. Actually, this came from... Oh, I'm, I forgot actually who it came from. I won't say, but um, anyway, be, <laughs> being an accomplished player has nothing to do with how to produce good playing conditions or understanding golf course architecture. Now, again, new green chairman come in, and maybe they come in with the wrong idea, and it's kind of sad if you're on a three-year rotation for some green committees, and uh, the first year you see all these flaws, the second year you kind of learn a little bit, and they realize that maybe they overstepped their bounds, and, and their, uh, some of their ideas, idealistic approaches are softened a little bit. In the third year, they actually get become good green chairman, and then there's time for a new guy. So uh, that, that might be part of the, the problem. Oh. OK. Um, there are no instant fixes. Programs take time and patience to fully impact correct conditions. And that can be the same with the superintendent. You've got to have patience in the program. <coughs> uh, fairway top dressing, I know it's become a big program for a lot of clubs. And, you know, they want to get firm and fast. They might want to take care of some earthworms, suppress earthworms. And we started top dressing last year. What's going on? It takes time. It'll happen. It's not going to happen overnight. Nothing, especially with agronomy and nature, usually does. And firm and fast is another topic Gab's going to talk about. But it's the same thing. It's not going to happen overnight. There are a lot of things that you have to develop. You have to get this, the conditions right to be able to provide championship like or firm and fast conditions on a daily basis, uh, you know, a fairly consistent basis anyway. So it takes time. And the chairman and the Green Committee should realize no matter how good of a golfer is, they're speaking for the entire membership and you have variable, uh, you know, players, different handicap levels, different skill sets, different desires, and hopefully support all of those or try to represent those to the best degree you can. The reason I say that from a superintendent's standpoint is because the superintendent's in the middle of it. <laughs> and uh, 
got to have some direction of which way you want to go, and hopefully that's not bucking 90% of the members for 10% of, the, of, of your green committee might represent only 10% of the members. So it's important. Uh, you pretty much want to stay out of the middle of it. Stick to the mission statement. It's been developed for a reason. Um, and, and hopefully uh, you can move forward and, again, support that and, and get it going. Stay off the tangents. Um, and this was just final. This is from a smaller club up north, up in Maine, actually. And, and I thought it was a good point that I wanted to bring it up.